Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Wrestle Horror. And greetings, viewers and listeners. Meet Hook Jim here, along with my co-host, Donnie Hoover. Donnie, what is going on today? Oh, man, all kind of good stuff. Getting close to the weekend. Got a lot planned, so uh, it's time to get busy. Well, on this episode of the Wrestle Horror Podcast, we've got a special guest. He actually coined the name Meat Hook Jim. I am, of course, talking about one quarter of the big scary show, Jason Storm. Storm, how is it going, man? Oh, yeah. Welcome, Wrestle Horror guests. You're in for a treat tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, you know, all listeners, Jim, Donnie, good to be here tonight. Oh, yeah. I don't think we've ever started a show off that way before. <laughs> no, you know, you've never had anyone channel the ghost of um, uh, of, of Randy Savage? That's, <laughs> Not yet. Uh, that's good that was to say, chan channeling Macho Man Randy Savage, that was great, Storm. I almost died when he died. I, I you know, they, they said on the radio, oh, Macho Man Randy Savage had died of a heart attack. I almost drove the car sideways, you know, off the highway, or just screaming in sideways. It, was, it was, mm -hmm. could have been bad. <laughs> So, Storm, you know, you and I have known each other for a number of years. You know, we've done Big Scary Show for eight plus now, what, eight and a half, I think? Something like that. Um, eight and three-fifths. But I also knew that you were a big wrestling fan, and that's where I want to steer the conversation initially. Uh, I mean, you, growing up in, in the Northeast, I'm assuming that you were a big WWF, WWE fan. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the McMahons, Vince and his father, you, you had to. I think, you know, when you're born in New Jersey or New York, you, you, you have to sign over that you're going to be a WWF fan. And, and, and pretty much, you know, is the only thing uh, that would be on because it'd be on the cable access up here because they get that on there. And then nothing was better than the um, Saturday night wrestling which was always fantastic it, you know i'm a night owl i'd stay up oh saturday night life oh no it's wrestling Woo <laughs> was it saturday night main event was that it that's it yep and they, they'd have some good stuff like the royal rumble that type of thing you know my father was never going to buy a pay-per-view so that was like the closest to a pay-per-view that you could get in the 80s and 90s if you weren't buying it okay so when did you start watching wrestling um you'd watch it that uh you know uh into that glow glow was like a big thing that was sunday after church we're going to watch the gorgeous <laughs> ladies of wrestling uh and then you, you you catch it when it's on uh sometimes they do recap shows and stuff and then you know when you started having uh the monday night wars with raw and nitro and cable and stuff you know get into watching and have it on the mondays and then really in college you know you'd watch it with other wrestling fans it's one thing to watch it with you know your brother and sister and you still gotta do your homework and stuff that night and when you're in college, you got a couple of beers and you a couple of your buds sitting on the couch. That's that's when wrestling and their bad writing is the most fun. <laughs> you know, it's funny you mentioned Glow. Uh, and on previous episodes, we've had both the Royal Hawaiian and Hollywood on Wrestle Horror. Oh, fantastic. Twice. <laughs> yeah, twice each. And I'm sure they'll be coming back uh, again here shortly. <laughs> and they've right. a, yeah, they've gotten a nice little pop and people remembering they exist with the, uh, I think, Netflix series. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's always a plus. And, you know, they, they, they are true real wrestlers. I'm glad that some of the shows have gotten back uh, to that. Uh, sometimes pushing a little too much, but the, the whole diva thing that they're doing years ago, even, um, you know, WCW, it was like, you know, it, it, it's a pretty face and let's see the smallest wrestling outfit we could possibly fit on them. But now you got some really good technical athletic wrestlers in there and it's not just harsh screaming. Well, not all the time. They do still use that, which I don't, uh, and, and then, and then the bad trend that that they're doing right now in uh, WWE is they're gluing Muppets onto these poor women's head. You know, Sasha Banks, I, I just see a purple Muppet on her head. I, <laughs> and this this week they had like Muppets on everybody's head out there. Everybody's got green flowing hair and stuff going. It doesn't even look right. It's like, oh, that's just I can't be healthy. Right. <laughs> so. That's a, an interesting analogy. I mean, I, I, I'm laughing inside. I'm smiling. I know you can't see us, but it's like, oh, oh I can gosh. see you guys. You just can't see me. Oh, okay. It's, it's like, oh, my gosh, that is just a great analogy. Um, what is your take on the whole, uh, um, uh, was it uh, 
Bailey Dose Belts. Is it now that? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's trying to make Bailey into a heel. And, you know, on, honestly, what I was hoping for with Bailey is she just reminds me of Punky Brewster. <laughs> and she needed an evil millionaire to either make his heart grow two sizes or to be corrupted by. So they should have matched her up with uh, the million dollar man. I mean, that would have just, and just steal every single episode and script of Punky Brewster and go with it. You know, have, have the million dollar man learn a lesson, but Bailey also learn a lesson of life. So, you know, they're, they're trying to do the heel thing. They're trying to do the Sasha thing. And they're like, yeah, they're going to turn on each other. Yeah, maybe not. Do we have anybody else who you care about in this women's division who doesn't scream in some other language, which I don't even think they, you know, um, Asuka. Yeah, I, I think, I don't even think she's doing Japanese. I think she's just out there yelling. But you could tell the cultural sensitivity of WWE and Vince when they named the women's t Japanese tag team after Japanese historical theater only performed by men. Yes, the Kabuki Warriors. So I'm like, kind of, hey, Vince! Love the social sensitivity there, Vince. Thank you. You know, what scares me is I think – if any WWE writers listen to the show, they're going to go, hmm, that's a good idea. I, I, they, they, I've been asking them to steal my ideas for a while. I won't keep falling asleep during Raw. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, this is this is very uh, – I love the way you rant, Storm. It, it's been something that I've enjoyed since we started doing the show and even when we were doing the old podcast. So. Oh, yeah. I try. I try. I <laughs> want to bring a little energy and stuff to it. You know, and I got a nice tasty beverage, keep it going. And then, yeah, I, I love ranting about this stuff. And I am a, I, I'm a wrestling fan, but I'm also a wrestling cynic. You know, there, there are some things that they do with the scripts and, and going with it. it. One thing that I hate, and I, you know, I was thinking about earlier before we came on, I'm like, oh, you know, who are my favorite wrestlers? Who have I liked during the different uh, uh, times and stuff? And you know, I, Big Boss Man is one of my favorite because as an overweight white kid growing up, up. Of course you love Big Boss, man. Undertaker, he was cool. And, you know, Mick Foley was one who I liked, The Rock. And I was thinking, you know, I never got into, like, you know, Triple H and, and the whole Degeneration X fans. Never big fans of and, and I was thinking, you know, what is it that I like and don't like about wrestling? One of the things I hate during a match is the fake injury thing. You know, that, that gimmick so played out. Oh, oh, my knee. Oh, but I'll jump off of it this way and stuff. I, I think it's so played out. And because they sort of want wrestling to be taken more seriously and to showcase the athletics of it, you can't tell if a wrestler has a fake injury or a real injury because they just write both of them in the script now. If it's written into it, it's fake because it's, it's in there with it. So you can't – the storyline's mixed with that. And thinking back, you know, Mick Foley never faked an injury. You know, the, the Rock, he didn't have to fake an injury. Boss Man, no, he'd usually be unconscious before he'd fake an injury. So, you know, I, I think that has – shaped which wrestlers i really like which gimmicks i really like and stuff out there i just you know sometimes like the fun stuff you know stone cold steve austin bringing out some random vehicle at the end and you know beer milk whoever the sponsor of the week is that's a fun way to end the show and but even the three hour format i think starts to lose me too because there's so much stuff in the middle it's a long day from work we don't get going with the wrestling till nine i find myself falling asleep like whatever the hell they did at the end of this one with you know you have rioters burning down a fake substation in the back or whatever that they did. I fell asleep through it. I don't know if it's good or not. You know, Shane with, you know, strippers that have change coin machines on their belts because you're not giving them dollars. You're giving them quarters uh, in, in a ring in a basement with no ropes. I mean, you know, you, you guys, even with the independent stuff and things, you probably looked at it and go, well, oh, that's cheap. You didn't even buy any ropes. I mean, at least, you know, put up, rope you got from home cheapo or something why, why have the poles in a ring if it's just going to be you know a performance stage you know we're going to do peter and the wolf and, and you know the little fight club vibe to it but again no fell asleep so i didn't catch anything else okay so that, know, that's where that payout gets lost what i heard is they're going for the whole shoot fight vibe which you know, obviously is is failing miserably in my opinion because it's still scripted. 
Yeah, I mean, and they're going anything that can go with. And you, you can script it and be good and stuff. You can let these guys go with. I mean, you guys know with the, you know, independent leagues and stuff, it, you have a little bit of scripting, but it's a little bit more organic. You don't have to try and, you know, appeal to every 13-year-old out there because you got to sell six T-shirts or, you know, you're, you're done. You, you can do that with showing the performance of these wrestlers and having them understand their gimmick a little bit or throw them with a good manager. Let's, let's, let's keep hiding all the good managers in WWE. Well, I got to agree with you there because uh, working with Donnie at some of his shows, uh, he, uh, I've looked at his run sheets <laughs> and it's pretty much do this, do what you want to do. Here's the finish. It's very organic, the matches, and that's what I enjoy about it because they don't have to make Vince happy. No, and that's, and that's how, especially, you know, in, in the independents, that's how you're going to get something to be viral. You can't manufacture something to be viral. You have to have something that really works. You know, one of the things that's gotten overused in um, uh, the WWE, and I don't even know, AC, 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 ACW, whatever it is, AEW, uh, AEW that's it. You know, I, I see a hundred posts on it a day. Uh, I can't remember if they really got any traction with any fans and stuff. Uh, I love their cruise thing; that was pretty cool. But um, you know, when the crowds, when you're at a match ten, fifteen years ago, and the crowd started chanting "Holy shit," it was worth it. Now I think they got plants in there because they're chanting it when for no reason, and it's like, oh, oh, you just want this chant going, all right? You, you, you're so bored with the with the match out there, you're just going to chant it so that you get some pop in the room for yourself because the nachos were too expensive. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, the live shows and house shows. There is such a different feel, and I gotta say that they're good with knowing their city and stuff too. Uh, you know. WWE would come to Providence a lot, and Providence isn't really a huge uh, uh, center for them to go in, but you still get, you know, 12, 15,000 fans packed in there if you do it right uh, for a wrestling event. But there are some good matches, and they'd, they'd really line up some good storyline there. And, you know, other than John Cena's uh, father always getting knocked out on the floor and getting to the craft services before everybody else, you know, there'd be some some good matches. Even the some even that end better than the dark match at the end. You know, the dark match would be a little fun or something here, but you know, I've seen street fights with um, uh, uh, Hart. I've seen uh, the, the when um, I always get his name backwards. Right. Um, uh, the yes guy. Oh, shoot. Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan. Bryan. I always call him Brian Daniel, by mis- which is his real name, I think. Yes. Um, Close. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 sometimes I'll get the uh, listeners, if I get the wrestlers mixed up, part of it is comedic effect. Part of it is I forget who the hell they are. So, um, and it's also a noise of my, you know, real diehard wrestling fan, fans who take it too seriously. Like, if you think there's a real draft, you're taking it too seriously. But uh, the, the one where Daniel Bryan was with um, uh, 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 the Wyatt brothers and stuff, and then he turned back. He took off his gas station overalls and was yesing with the crowd. That was in Providence. That was a fantastic match. I think there's a cage involved. That was the cage it, match, I think. It, it was great. It, uh, that was a great night. That wasn't even the dark match. That was just, you know, explosive, and they got some pop out. So they've always done good with figuring out what places are really going to pop and who they need to showcase, which which I've liked. And I think that's one of the challenges they got now. You know, you, you, you're not writing for that rotation. You're not writing for the um, – travel rotation i think stuff like AEW has actually been good for wwe because if you didn't have AEW with the r wrestlers in the stands yelling they would never have done that it, it it would it would have been like it started out two guys in a ring and a ref you know the fans going overhead and just thunk 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 grunt 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 so the competition i think is helping and that's always been a, a big push for WWE too, and um, you know I think it helps with AEW also. But please, someone pull Jericho away from the buffet, please. <laughs> I, I, I'm a fat bastard too, but dude, I'm worried about you. Oh wow, 
he was wearing some like 40 pound capacity leather pants and they were about to rip one one interview i'm like oh my oh dear no. slacking off on his ddp yoga I, I i don't know what it was you know it's, it keeps leaving the the belt at the old country buffet it's not good well at least the belt's on john moxley now hmm yeah, that was a neat pickup. That was good. And that was neat, too, because I don't trust any news source for wrestling either. And oh, he's going to AEW. He's doing this. He's doing that. And I'm like, nah, I don't believe it. I think they're playing it up. And I I liked that um, WWE didn't just bury him. You know, they did play in a script a little bit. Oh, I'm going to sit on the chair and explain why I'm leaving. Oh, I get interrupted. Well, okay, that's good. But they didn't. They gave him a pretty good send-off. They gave the Shield a little bit of a send-off. And goes what may, they didn't fire his wife outright either, which was nice. You know, they especially at that time and how much talent they're rolling through from Orlando and back up there. They could have done that in a heartbeat. They could have buried him in a heartbeat. But I actually uh, thought that was a good direction and way to go. And I'm I'm hoping they understand a little competition will keep both uh, brands fresh. Oh, I agree. I think the competition between the two is very healthy, just like it was when it was WCW versus WWE. The The competition is what kept everything going fresh, new. It wasn't stale. So let's just keep – let's hope it keeps going that way. And it's neat because they even had some of that going when they didn't have a professional competition. You know, they, they actually got smacked down in Raw – to be right. a little bit against each other and, and go with that. But it's when they started shuffling the decks and doing drafts and doing it every year that's, well, I'm watching the same show. And then, you know, can you really commit six to five to six hours a week in wrestling? Right. You got to be writing some damn good stuff if you want people to commit, you know, five, six hours, almost a work day to just watch and wrestling. You know, I will say that um, the dark horse in all of this, and, you know, I I get a lot of flack for this, but I'm a big Impact fan. And Impact is really, really stepping up their game. They've signed some big names, some old WWE talent. uh, And they are getting – they were trending big time for their Slammiversary pay-per-view recently. Yeah, their their biggest problem is I don't know what the hell station they're on. They're, they're syndicated at midnight next to New Japan Wrestling, and that, that's not bad. Was it the the Ring of Honor Wrestling? Ah, something's wrong with that. I don't know yeah. what they what they do with that. Something's just wrong with that. And they'd like you know Impact would be right before or after, so I forget which one I'm watching. And you don't you don't make an appointment to watch it or even to set your DVR nowadays. So I think that that was their problem is. Uh, you know, not making that TV deal. At least uh, the cons knew, get in there, get the TV deal before you even sign the talent. Well, um, Impact does have a TV deal because they own the station, or their parent company does, called Access TV. Oh, yes, Access, yes. Yes. So they're on Access every Tuesday at like 8 o'clock now. All right, there we go. I got to remember so, that. They're in, they're in between, you know, Metallica concerts and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, old Rolling Stone live videos or whatever. Right. But uh, it, they're, they're, they're gaining steam. They're gaining recognition. Um, I'm looking for – I mean, they're never going to be, in my opinion, up in between those two. But they're going to – I think they're going to be the close third. Well, as you guys know, people – People like a good show, even if it's not, you know, the the high end super talent. If you write it and do it well, people would like to see the minor leagues. And on top of that, they also push the envelope more than WWE and AEW do. That's a that's a good thing too. It's, it's a target market for that. I, you know, I I have a marketing major, a background with that. That's one of the things I do a lot with haunting, and uh, you know, one of the things that drive me nuts is, oh, who do you want to market to? Everybody. No, you. That's not how it works. So if you want to market to an older, you know, more wrestling savvy fan crowd, you can have a lot of success doing that. And I'm sure out of 300 million people in the country, you can pick up a million to watch it. If you're targeting that exact market. I agree. You know, I've been asking you a lot and talking to you a lot, a lot of questions, a lot of comments. And Donnie's just sitting back there 
not saying oh, a word. Is, who is this guy? Where did Jim? I mean, I let it. I let it soak in. I don't say. I'll, if they're talking, I'll sit here and listen. I was going to ask Donnie, do you have any questions for Storm? Uh, I was just going to ask him about like he, he had done the uh, the Macho Man impersonation, and he mentioned Big Boss Man, and I was just going to ask him who his favorites were, like growing up and and when he got into wrestling and all that. Well, being such a fan of horror and Halloween, of course, Undertaker. Paul Bearer was fantastic. Ooh, Undertaker. Ooh, we got to do something with a cask. I mean, fantastic with that. Um, uh, the uh, Dudleys, like them, and then uh, Bushwhackers. Oh, God, I loved when the Bushwhackers came out because there are a bunch of wacky, zany guys coming out, you know, wearing camouflage and doing something goofy. Um, <laughs> you know, those are some of my favorite. I, I did like Big Boss, man. I, I, I felt he wasn't used as well in some of his career. He was neat in, like, house matches, too. They would give him some crazy ass, you know, contract in the suitcase before it was, you know, money in the bank type of, you know, uh, your career on a pole house match in Providence on a Saturday night. That was fun. And he'd go up against somebody nuts like Randy Orton and stuff and just get crushed. But, you know, he'd try, his shirt would be all untucked, and he'd get back up, and he'd make a good show of it. So it's a bummer. It'd be interesting to see what he could do with his career and if he could reinvent himself, too, uh, you know, after wrestling and uh, if he'd lived on a little bit. They, they haven't put him in the fake Hall of Fame yet either, have they? That's, that's still a travesty. False man? I don't think he is. No. Well, don't worry. That Again, that's another thing people take seriously. And I'm like, no. The Hall of Fame, I, I am convinced Vince just has it so that he can print it out once a year and wipe his ass with it. You know, <laughs> I, I honestly think that's the only reason he does Because there's no – I'm in Rhode Island. I, you know, I drive by the wrestling um, uh, headquarters that they're moving to a smaller office soon enough. There's no Hall of Fame in there. You can't go take a tour. You're not going to see any of that. Why? Because it doesn't exist. And it's, it's fun. And it's something neat to honor them, but don't get too serious like it's Canton, Ohio. There's no professional writers. That, oh, the ballots are in for the Hall of Fame this year. No, no, they're not. Vince gave you a name of who he wants in and not. No one voted. And, and then they'll put that in the commentation board. Oh, is this a first-round ballot? No, no one's – there's no Wrestling Writers Alliance or anything out there voting for this. And if there was, their votes wouldn't count for anything. That's – oh, that's the other thing, you know, with the network. There was rumors that the tier system um, – if you buy the higher tier, you could vote for the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's, let's see an auditor check those votes. They ain't counting for nothing. That's $5 more a month that's just going out the window. <laughs> they killed that higher tier. Uh, they, 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 they killed a lot with it. They, they, they don't showcase enough with it on it, too. And then, you know, they shoot themselves in the foot. You know, COVID and stuff, um, you got the pe- people at home, and they probably could have really – kept up the subscriptions and sponsorship even though they're doing pretty good now because they stopped giving away every uh, other month you know oh if you're a new subscriber and household you can do that and you know all right good you know little johnny guess what you're getting wrestling next month so we can watch SummerSlam. um you know they they cut that back and they've actually seen a jump with the the um streaming uh, but i think they could have had it a little bit better if they marketed a little bit more um advertising for it on its own network during the wrestling programs, it, you might have saturated that market. You know, I'm sure there's some there's some uh, second shifters who don't get home to watch Raw, but they're big fans of matches from the 80s and stuff. Uh, and then, you know, they also sold uh, all the other rights. You know, if Raw showed up two weeks later on a network, I'd probably be watching it more. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, you got to find stuff from like 10 years ago because those rights are with Hulu. And then when the COVID started, you know, oh, let's switch on ESPN. Oh, look, wrestling has sold WrestleMania 14 to ESPN, and you'd watch it there. We're paying for the network. I can turn on the match without the commercials, but no, I'm sitting here watching on FX1 or or ESPN Ocho or whatever they had it on because, you know, you're not thinking to go with it. So they're not driving non-pay-per-view traffic to the stream, and I think they could, you know. Uh, um, I, I think, you know, Netflix would be the only one in town for such a long time and they'd drop all their episodes at once. Uh, one of the things I think Disney has done well with streaming is, you know, they'd have episodes come out weekly. 
So you got to keep coming back. Right. When I do that, I'd see also what other movie are they pushing? What's, what, what's going on with it? And WWE was doing that for a while, but they're also, you got so much content in, in your vault, so much neat stuff, but let's spend more money to produce wrestlers in a car driving. And one or two of the stories are fun, but you could really just have them sit in a chair and do that and show some classic matches, you know, MS3K, some of the classic matches without all the production costs. So then, you know, so it's a little bit with it, but yeah, well, let's make a cartoon of wrestlers if they're at camp. Yay. <laughs> I actually got a kick out of that. It, you get a kick out of it for like half an episode or something. And, you know, the commercials really beat it up, but really was it all that different than the Scooby-Doo episode where Kane showed up? No, <laughs> no. Uh, somebody was the voice of Kane in that, which was great because he never talked. I think he grunted twice. You know, I had to I had to go back to the Hall of Fame for a second. Um, and for what it's worth, I met um, Macho Man's brother, Lanny Poffo, mm -hmm. uh, back, I think, in December, January, somewhere in there. Uh, and I actually had the opportunity to put on Macho Man's Hall of Fame ring. Oh, wow. Awesome. Look on my Facebook pictures. You'll see. I think I've seen that. Yeah. yeah, it's a picture. That's Macho Man's uh, posthumous ring that's on my finger. That's good. I was reading an article this week, too, that, uh, you know, uh, Hulk had even mentioned that he and Macho Man sort of made up a couple months before Macho Man passed away, uh, which was good that there wasn't that full, real, you know, behind the uh, curtain animosity that there was between them for quite a while. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you ever venture out to any indie shows out your area? Is there any indie promotions out that way? There, there actually are a couple indie promotions, uh, mostly out a little bit western of me. I haven't gotten out to any. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the ones that would come through, uh, big time wrestling would tour through here a lot, and uh, was, haven't gotten to any of those. And uh, when some more of my wrestling friends uh, lived out here, they've actually moved. They would. Um, Excuse me. They would be, uh, I go to some of the house shows and stuff, but I think Showcase Pro Wrestling is like out of uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and they'll have some matches and stuff. I just haven't gotten to one, and they're on hold right now. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Are they allowing contact sports in, in your guys' state? They're not allowing anything. As a matter of fact, they just, in Rhode Island, they just came up with the COVID police. And a hotline number, if you see more than 15 people gathered, you can actually call a number and they'll send the state police in. So, really? yay! <laughs> wow. But yeah, no, all the, all the independent shows in the area are, are shut down because New England's been real, trying to really keep a cap on it and stuff, which has worked for the most part. But, you know, we're so depending on tourism in the summer, that was the hope that we could have uh, really had this going downward, but uh, oh. just hanging on at the moment. Uh, we're we're experiencing something similar in Ohio. There's absolutely no contact sports going on. Yeah, I was listening to part of your show from last week, and that, that, that's tough. And it's weird for it's weird for something like wrestling too, because it's it's limited contact. It's not like it's team sport contact. Right. So you can you know if if you get ability to test a little bit, there's a lot less liability. And toughest thing is it being in the indoor places, but you could do wrestling outdoor in the summer. You could do it at, uh, you know, one of these minor league ball fields aren't being used, even high school fields and stuff. You have it out on bleachers instead of a gym. You can still get a couple hundred people to come watch a show and be sure. pretty responsible with, uh, you know, your social distancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they're doing out in Indiana. They've, they're doing, like, outdoor events and stuff and spreading people out. I've seen a couple of them like that out there. Awesome. Awesome. The big thing they've been doing here is like the drive-in type of thing too, you know, and that, that, you know, even if they could allow some type of contact and stuff, and if you go the WWE route, you know, videotape it and then throw it up on a drive-in screen or something, you know, that, that might be an option. That seems to be where a lot of stuff is going, even with haunts and stuff, you know, if they're going open, they're trying to do a drive through thing. Uh, the zoo here does a big jack-o'-lantern festival every October. And they just announced this week that it's going to be drive through. So they'll have it through the parking lot, through part of the zoo. So I can't wait to go off-roading in the aardvark exhibit. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm also not sure. I, I'm on the roads with other Rhode Islanders every day. And it's scary. 
yeah, I mean, frightening, scary. So I, I don't know how well a drive through through the zoo surrounded by scary gourds is going to go. That something bad is going to happen with that. And uh, there'll be a car upside down in a lake or, you know, in the penguin exhibit or something. <laughs> yeah, that's like you got you brought that up. I've heard there's supposed to be people are going to experiment with like drive through haunts and that kind of thing. Uh, what's your guys' thoughts on that? I don't I don't know how that would work if you got a guy with his foot on the gas and you scare the shit out of him. It's like, right. <laughs> it might not end very well. Um, I worked at a uh, um, haunted hayride for 10 years and even with your own drivers and it's not even as much as worrying about the drivers. It's your actors. You're, is that you can drill into them so much that safety and they get that thrill. They get that overzealous thing and they'll try and get that last scare in. And with the a drive through haunt, if the, if the people are operating the car, you know, you're hoping people aren't showing up drunk and stuff, but you know, people are, uh, you know, what's going to be that scare too close? What's going to be the, you know, a passenger get out of the car? What's going to be your actor trying to go for that second scare and the driver's foot steps off the brake and, you know, it run over a, a leg or a toe or, or something, you know, that's a best case scenario. There, there are some things that can go wrong. And as you know, especially if you have this size for an outdoor haunt, you're not on level ground either. So, you know, a, a car, you take the brake off and it can get rolling real quick and can be real sudden. And, and the lighting is the other thing too. You know, when we're doing a hayride, they'd be the same drivers knowing the same track so that they could drive in the dark. So where are you going to have headlights on? They're going to blow up all your scenes and stuff and take away um, what you're hoping to express or, you know, oh, come up to the scene and turn off your lights. Well, you've already overexposed everything to the light. You've gotten there. Now your actors, their eyes got to adjust and to know when to go and stuff. It's not impossible. Can be done the right way. It's just going to take a lot of extra precaution and some creativity, which is the neat thing with haunters and wrestlers. Um, you know, one of the big things they're shared, and I think that's why it's such a cross market, is it's acting and creativity. So you know, while you get some of the egos, you you can see them step up to, to something like this. I, I think you'll see more haunted themes, more haunts uh, this October being able to run than some of your Christmas-like themes. I think you'll see Christmas things really cut back uh, because it's going to be so much harder for them to to do any type of seasonal thing. I mean, you know, if we're still in the same type of scenario as we are now, will they let children sit on Santa's lap at the mall? Good question. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know it's, it, it's I, I, I think Halloween uh, haunters – I, I think they they can step up to this if they need to, if they can, if they have the ability to. But uh, it, it'll definitely be interesting after it. And hopefully it can be, you know, you do a haunt. You do it responsible. Maybe that can open up the door so that, you know, states will be a little bit easier to have independent wrestling shows. Oh, look, this haunt was able to do it. We didn't have an outbreak with it. You know, this, this January we're going to let – uh, independent show with a cap of 200 people or whatever, you know, go. We're going to have that contact sports with these restrictions because some things were able to be done. So hopefully, Haunters, you can do it right and you could set example for some of these states and really be a showcase. So, Storm, you've got your thumb on the pulse of what's going on in Rhode Island haunt-wise. Um, have you seen a lot of closures up that way? Um, not, not the big ones here. Um, the, the biggest thing has been Salem as just, um, announced they're not doing any of their, uh, city, uh, sponsored events. So the city sponsored parade, the fireworks, some of your outdoor markets and stuff, they've already said, we're not doing it this October. And that's, that's a big blow. That's a big tradition thing, but that doesn't mean there won't be private events. It doesn't mean there won't be, you know, just people showing up to Salem in the festive attitude. Right now, that's the biggest one. I'm watching, you know, some of the bigger haunts up here. We don't have some of the giant theme park haunts that you'd think. The theme parks up in New England are, are quite small, the uh, handful that we have. And 
the uh, the three theme parks in the area really aren't known for their haunts either. It's a uh, you know a Six Flags, which is like the smallest one of them all, uh, but it's way out in Western Mass. Um, I think the Big E was canceled. I don't know if they've done a haunt there. Uh, Big E is like a state fair, but for all of New England. Um, but I haven't heard on some of the bigger ones here, like Spooky World. I think Haunted Overload is still planning to go. They just gave a little tour to some New England haunters this past weekend. But, you know, they've always done time ticketing. They've always had the limit uh, availability because it's just so popular. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a charity-based haunt, and the way they've worked it out, their overhead is real low. So they can probably go and work it out. I don't know if something like Spooky World, um, Nightmare New England, is going to be able to, because that's, you know, like a eight, nine house attraction haunt. You know, the overhead and everything with that, you, you get to such a limit, you got to have X number of thousand people a night or you're losing money. So... Right. I don't know. They might have to look at that line and draw it. And it's, I, I think they're all playing it by ear with the States and hoping for the best, or if they got to do a toned down show. Well, we're seeing, uh, I've been watching scare factors website and, you know, trying to keep track of who's closing and who's not. And, you know, I think the big thing that shocked a lot of people was uh, uh, Halloween horror nights at universal shutting down for the year. I mean, granted, given the fact that Florida is becoming like the number two hotspot, it makes sense, but still a big blow to the industry. A uh, real bummer. And even some of that wasn't as much as the hotspot blow up as the financial situation Universal is. Two weeks before they announced um, that they weren't doing Halloween Horror Nights, they did a huge cut of their creative and uh, back of the house people, your accountants, uh, the people who would build those sets, who would set that type of stuff up, who would write the stories and stuff. And part of me was hoping that wasn't an indicator for their seasonal events because maybe they'll just whip out what they used last year and hope for the best. All right. But um, I think that played into it too. I, I think, you know, the changeover, the promotion of it and stuff, there and when Florida did open up these parks, they didn't see as big of a pop as they had expected. So I know that there's a lot of um, hesitancy for tourism. So could you do Halloween Horror Nights and scale it back? Yes. Are you going to hit the threshold where you're not losing more money by trying to do it? And I, I, I think you know the bean counters looked at it and said that's not going to work. And creatively do you want to do there's nothing worse a haunt than a slow night that you just don't have that feel to it you know that that that's if you want to burn out a haunter string together a slow night bad weather weekend oh yeah you know it's it's no, that was every weekend at our trail <laughs> <laughs> and it is it and that's the thing that it, it makes it harder for you to want to do it the next year and put the energy into it and, you know, I, I think, you know, that's part of some of these theme parks and stuff, too. That's not just a money bottom line, but they do have to invest so much into it. And your creative people invest so much into it is just going to burn them out and, and, and try so hard and see it fail. Or do you take a year off? So that's why, you know, anybody out there, don't don't guilt any haunts that don't run this year. Right. If they think that they can do it and come back go for it we see so many haunts year after year that will try try and try and say oh we're going to take a year off and they never open again you know hopefully you know decisions and stuff that's being done we see these haunts come back for 2021 i've oh. never been to halloween horror nights do they do a congo congo line style with the customers or does or is it groups or um, it, it depends on nights and stuff. I haven't actually gotten down to the Halloween Horror Nights. I've had some friends who've worked with it, uh, but they will have some constant flow. I think yes. they've been working to, especially in the houses, but they have their shows and stuff. You know, it's, it's more immersive, uh, especially at the theme parks. It's not just walking through a house with a constant flow. You'll have that, but you also have the setup outside of it. You have your queue line actors aren't working a queue line. Unfortunately, your beer garden salespeople are, which is a whole nother 
awful mix. But, you know, what would be a Q actor for a haunt like ours are out in midways and, and entertain with that. And you still have the rides. So you can have capacity and people are at a show or at a ride or going through the house. So it's not the full crushing constant flow. And the other good thing is, too, they have such wonderful designers and stuff for their mazes that you can you can build that with constant flow in mind and still have that immersive scare, still give that ability to actors. One of the best um, uses of that, which would work with constant flow, I remember there's a haunt I went through on a tour years ago in Ohio. I don't remember exactly which one. Uh, and it had like a spinning disc at the end of the hallway. And it was lit up and it was like over the doorway you walk through, but you couldn't see because the room was dark and it was on a little ramp down and you couldn't help, but look at that spinning disc. So it drew your eye level up there and you're able to be surprised at actors at the end of the ramp because you weren't anticipating them. You were just pulled up to that. And that's, that's something that, you know, is effective for a constant flow. When you have a busy haunt with something like that, you're pulling the eye level away someplace so you can get a fast scare in another direction. You know, one of the things we did on our walkthrough uh, at the Trails of Terror where I worked, one of my favorite uh, things we did uh, is in between two scenes we had a really dark area in our trail we wanted to do something but we weren't sure what and there's a soundtrack uh, you know is in the haunt industry at the time and it was just children singing ring around the rosy hmm. and laughing and we just put that on an event box out in the woods so when the group was leaving one scene the actor could hit a doorbell and that would trigger the event box and it was on like a 45 second delay. So they'd be between the two scenes in the dark. And then you just hear ring around the rosy. Just think of it like two octaves uh, higher. And, and, you know, these children singing it in the woods and people thought all hell was about to break loose. And they were just so messed up by the time they got to the next scene because literally shadows are jumping out at them when no shadows are jumping out. Oh my God, I see the actor there. And I'm chuckling because I'm like 20 feet down the path and I'm like, there's no one out there. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, even with constant flow and, you know, nowadays, you know, social distancing, you know, trick or treating, build your candy pulse now, everyone. Um, it, it, you, you could do it. You could be clever with it and, you know, you could save Halloween and still have it fun. You know, Storm, I got to say, you hit the nail on the head with uh, Halloween Horror Nights. I've actually been twice, uh, and it is very immersive, and the queue lines are actually in the midways. Very entertaining. It's it's something I've never seen before, um, and really, it's just it, it completely, you know, I you said it, completely immersive. Uh, we went through, uh, I remember one in particular, went through a sound stage, and on the inside, it was built to be a vampire castle, mm -hmm. and the detail was second to none. Beautiful. Incredible, and that's a neat thing with Constant Flow, is you can catch that detail. Yes. You know, half the time, you have a good house, and if you have breaks in between the groups, uh, people would ask, while well, I was a Q actor, how long does it take to do the trail? How fast can you run? Because it could take an hour to walk through it, but usually people are getting through it in about 30 minutes because they, they were picking up the pace if there wasn't uh, someone hiding in a hoodie four feet in front of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we had something similar when I worked at the Dent Schoolhouse back in the detention hall maze. They would ask me, because I was working the queue and the, and the maze itself, and they'd say, how long does it take to get through? I said, well, how bad do you want to live? <laughs> um, I said it can take you five minutes it could take you 30 I kept people in that maze for over an hour oh yes that's fantastic I do always love the stupid questions I, and you know the, uh, I'll tell a quick story and then I'll ask a quick question you guys find this with wrestling okay. you know sometimes people ask the weirdest dumbest stuff in the middle of a show like I'm sitting there or standing there under a big sign that says trails to terror and the people will ask me, is it scary? And I'd look at them, and especially if it's my, you know, 
more demonic sideshow Barker uh, mm-hmm. character. And I would go, well, it ain't Trails to Rainbows. So, I mean, people just asking the obvious. Do you guys see that with the independent shows? Are people like, oh, are they going Russell? Yeah, well, I've heard, I've had people ask if it was fake and stuff like that. But the funniest dumb question I've ever encountered was because I wrestled myself back in late 90s, early 2000s, and I did a lot of bleeding in my matches. And I was doing this one match, and I got hit with the chair. So, of course, I I hit the gimmick, and I started bleeding, and I rolled out of the ring. So my face wasn't bleeding. Yeah, I didn't have, like, a, a lot of blood on my face. And I rolled out of the ring, and I sat up, and I'm in front of this family. And the blood just starts, like, pouring down my face. And it's obvious I'm cut. I'm bleeding. And the mom asked me, she's like, is that fake blood? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I just kind of, yeah. yes, we have super Hollywood special effects, so it's pouring out of my forehead with no visible lines. Yeah, right. yeah. I just kind of looked at her, and I was the heel, so I just made like I don't even remember what I said to her. I made some shitty comment to her, and and uh, just like whirled over and got up. <laughs> I was just like, yeah. like that was the dumbest question I ever heard. <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I do love how people can't understand the difference between scripted and fake. You know, yeah. just throw it in there. Scripted, it's fine. I mean, it's, you know, people, uh, you know, especially in the 90s and stuff, and I've, you know, watched wrestling and see if anybody else at work and like somebody in the accounting department would go, well, how can you watch that? It's all fake. And I look at him and I go, well, so is friends. And do you ever sit there and hope that one day someone would just pick up a folding chair and hit Ross in the head? Well, that can happen on wrestling. Yep. That's exactly it. You know, it's the, and I, I, I know a lot of wrestlers and, you know, it just chaps their ass when people say it's fake um, because it's not. They are very athletic people and it takes a lot to do what they do. Oh, absolutely. Doing your own stunts. And it, it is fantastic athletic. And, you know, I think that's that's what bothers me with, you know, like I said at the beginning of the show, how I, I hate the fake injury because that's taking away from the athleticism and the story you're writing of, you know, the skill against each other. You know, you see somebody do a good backflip, they're, they're, they're there. You hate when they push a wrestler who's not ready for the ring. You can see the other wrestler directing them, seeing them, you know, oh, you're not selling that kick. Oh, you missed him by a mile. No camera angle can hide that one. You know, eh, maybe they moved you up a little too quick because, you know, you're eight feet and you look like the flavor of the week. You know, eh, bummer. Work with that. But that's that's the thing. You know, it's, oh, that part of it's fake. Don't have to worry about it. Leave it to the writers. No, that's that's where you really got to build yourself. And that's why, you know, you, you don't just invent a wrestler and, and have it work. They got, you know, break their teeth and, and get their chops coming up through independent wrestling leagues, foreign ones, because that really develops their character and how they can sell it. Uh, you know, the writer's going to get you there. I mean, the, the best story in the world is, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin was supposed to be the ringmaster. <laughs> and he said, no. And, you know, he had, he had a chance of getting fired with that. But he, he'd known that he he can use his tough guy, Stone Cold image and not be the ringmaster. You know, that, that's a very different alternate reality that could have unfolded right there, people. Oh, absolutely. That would have been a completely different – it would have buried him. But, you know, you mentioned about how the the, the injuries and how they work and – a prime example is my daughter, as you know, I've, mm-hmm. I've said it many times, she's training. Um, she was at rehearsal or training two nights ago, and her cheek met the turnbuckle without yeah. a pad. Yeah. Completely unscripted, but it happened. Yes. And she split open her cheek hitting that turnbuckle. Yeah, and, 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 you know, that's that's a real injury. How is that, you know, you got the people in the thing thinking it's fake because they would, written in the in in the show is, uh, you know, could have been three weeks ago with somebody hitting a turnbuckle and acting all woozy, you know, or hitting the turnbuckle and their knee buckling and stuff. You know, you that's one of the lines which I think you could, you want to be taken more as a sport, you, you, you want it, some of your, your storylines to be taken more seriously. Don't play around with stuff like injury, especially when injuries are such a real thing with the industry. 
right. um, do not murder Ray Mysterio. Send him <laughs> off. Send him off the building and say nothing of it. Oh, look, Ray Mysterio just plummeted to his death. Oh no, he's there next week. Well, I mean, they got me. I watched the eye for an eye match or whatever stupid gimmick they're going with that. I'm like, how are they going to do this dumbass thing? And oh, they're pushing my eye against stairs. Oh, when uh, uh, Rollins comes out with a freaking pliers, I'm like, well, that's the least efficient thing to take someone's eye out. I mean, you know, come out, know. come out with a scoop or a screwdriver or something. Ooh, look, I got, I got pliers. Ooh, and which he never uses. But then, oh, we did it. We ripped out Ray Mysterio's eye, and he's mysteriously grown back. He, he still has his vision, and it's there because Rey Mysterio can die off the side of a building and then grow his eye back. I'm like, eh, you guys can, you know, they, they, they love their loose ends and never never put him back together. Like, you know, uh, Vince blew up once, if everybody doesn't remember that. I remember that. <laughs> Any fan does. I mean, it, it was well done, made it look like he's in there, a good edit, and they blew the hell out of some rental limousine. And unfortunately, there's some tragedy later, so he had to come out of hiding and and, and uh, come out on the stage. Uh, you know, so we never knew exactly what it is. But let's just ignore we blew up Vince. Let's ignore that uh, Triple H uh, once kidnapped uh, uh, Stephanie and got married in a drive-through or something before they actually got married and stuff. Uh, uh, was it Jericho? I think he had kidnapped China and was pulling out her fingernails with pliers once. I mean, I, I love these unfinished storylines that we'll just never, never mention again. Paul Bearer, I think he was buried under six tons of concrete once and then showed up like a year later. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm fine. Yeah, I dug my way out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, you know, there is a very real injuries like, uh, what was it, uh, Psycho Sid. Uh -huh. um, when uh, during a match, he landed on his leg and it immediately snapped. And it's on video all over the place. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing that, it, you know, when, when they do the fake, oh, I hurt my knee, it takes away from that kind of stuff. Right. And respect you'd have for that wrestler. And I, I think it takes away from the pop of them coming back. Oh, is this a fake industry because they went to go get a boob job? Is this a fake industry because they just wanted a break in rotation? You know, there's no sympathy when they come back. You know, one of the best comebacks was freaking Triple H when he ripped his freaking hamstring off the bone. Mm -hmm. You know, that he really had to work and push to come back to that. And that's a showcase. And I think that's why his career didn't falter with that and even to today he, he he's he, he might ride down the motorcycle ring and get all greased up and roll around with another 45 year old with a hammer uh god i hated that undertaker match where they just rolled around with a hammer uh <laughs> but but you know he can still pull in a crowd for that he can still showcase it and that's that's because you know he really didn't fake injuries and he came back from it and you knew the story of it even if you're a casual fan right yeah, speaking of coming back from real injuries and Rey Mysterio's eye, they for you know, people forget about Vader too. Where Vader, his eye come, his eye came out uh, during a match with Stan Hansen. And I don't yeah. know. If, yeah, I don't know if you guys even knew about that one or seen it or anything. I think I'd heard rumors on that, but you hear a lot of rumors about Vader and some of the other guys. Uh, yeah, no, they just, hang within the day. Yeah, the video is on YouTube. If you just type in like Vader loses eye or Vader, oh yeah, no, Stan Hansen. No. Yeah, it it can't. It's like I mean, it's still being held in by his eyelids and stuff, but it's out. <laughs> it's yeah, like, I, I, I think I might on. have to be. Uh, I might have to be considering a tattoo level drunk to you know search <laughs> that. Yeah. And to listeners, I have no tattoos, so that's a lot of alcohol. <laughs> wow, this has been a this has been a great hour, Storm. You have just been um, very animated as you always are, and I think this episode's going to really—it's um, all the cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to wind it down here, so you know I'm not going to tell people all the social media stuff. You know the social media stuff. How can people find out more about you and about Big Scary Show? 
uh, bigscaryshow.com. That's the best place to go because then you'll find our links to, uh, you know, our Facebook pages, our Instagrams. We might even still have a Twitter and stuff on there, but that's, that's where you go. Bigscaryshow.com. You see our wonderful sponsors, you see our shows and you can find out all the neat ways to listen to us when you want to pull up a new episode, how to subscribe, what, what streaming things we're on, all of them, what, uh, smart speakers we're on, all of them try it out now hey hey uh alexa or whoever's in the room or whatever what's the weather see i just screwed you up but uh you know a- ask your smart speaker to play big scary show podcast just test it out right now go ahead try mm, we'll come back to you now but on, it, on alexa and all that is that as you do you guys have the full episode like the yeah. length time wise yep. is it nice not not only that but it, what's neat too is it'll pick up where you left off uh, on yep. some places i know you know one i go through goes through apple podcast or apple cast or you know apple teeny or whatever the hell they're calling it now and so you know i could be doing it during dinner stop the show and then on wednesday turn it back on and oh that's where i left off which is awesome for long format uh podcasts which which is neat so yeah, yeah check I, that out yeah i don't even think we've really talked about it much jim um what all do you guys have on big scary show i, I know it's like a like he said it's a long form podcast it cuts a couple hours more each episode and uh i know you guys got the round table and, and all kind of different stuff on there well we've got uh, a round table tape round table of terror is our signature segment and we talk to people in the industry the haunted attraction industry about different things we talk to charity haunts home haunters uh mask makers actor managers we're having a we're doing a round table this week on uh actor training i believe um and very very industry specific during the summer and leading up to halloween we also will talk um with uh horror we we've talked with wrestlers uh yeah. you know we'll, we'll bring in anything with the pop media and anything that inspires we're, we're a haunted industry podcast but you know it's anything that inspires it and, you know you guys are a wrestling podcast but you touch on on anything with it and if you like the athletics if you like the wrestling if like if you like the friggin you know um uh, these goofy game shows they on now like the ultimate tag and stuff you might want to listen to something like this because this is where you're going to hear people who might be training for that or, or the people who have a story and that type of athlete uh, that you got entranced by uh, without having to lose family members to car accidents and stuff like everybody on Titan games, apparently. And we are very comprehensive. We cover everything. I mean, there's a lot of haunt podcasts out there that are very specific, but we just cover, we're like a coverall. I mean, we've got uh, the deadline news, which Badger does, which is, you know, the current news that's going on in the industry. Um, Storm rants on, he finds something to rant on every every episode in a haunt minute, uh, and he he really pulls some current stuff out out of there that, and he just, you know, you have to listen to him. You heard him on this show, listen to him on the haunt minute. Uh, myself, I I'm doing a segment called Between the Corpses, and right now I'm going through a run of different funeral practices in different countries, um, and of course we've got Jerry Vane, the haunt instrumentalist, that he pulls out, he gets and reaches out to. Uh, horror musicians and and we play different types of horror music um, to fill in through there. We've got uh, Storm pulls out um, old um, horror movie trailers that we put in between. Um, We've got Eric Weister who does his Haunted Vista about whatever he wants to talk about. He's done, uh, I think he's on a 20 part segment called The Horror of It All. He's on number five or something like that right now. Uh, But there we cover the whole gamut of the industry. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I do have a, a question for Storm. I want to pick his brain a minute because you know how we always try to have our guests uh, talk about a certain topic and give some advice. And I was looking at his bio today and something jumped out at me that we've never really talked about here on WrestleHorror. And that's where he says he's got uh, he's got experience with voice work. So I, I, it got me thinking of like what all type of voice work could be done in the haunt industry. And, uh, you know, it got me thinking like, you know, voice work for like animatronics or like she, like he said, the girls, you know, doing ring around the Rosie in the woods and that kind of stuff. Can you uh, talk a little bit about voice work and haunt industry? Sure. Uh, it's, it's actually something that gets overlooked a lot of times too. Well, first of all, uh, your advertising, um, 
if if you're not doing if you're just and even for wrestling and for promotions too if you're just handing off the radio station for them to make a, a a show they don't they have no idea about your industry you know though for for haunted things if you say all right here make this they're going to do what they think is scary which means they're going to play thriller in the background that they shouldn't and they go ooh spooky haunted and stuff so you know with voice acting works you you can do with your characters you can work with it to actually have something to pull into it to give it more depth to tell the story you want to tell and give them those selling points into it so advertising is a big thing with it um what i did a lot of uh, voice work with, for the haunt i did we had a 30 minute hayride and that had a full soundtrack with a complete narration and we didn't have an actor on there narrating as it goes. This was all an MP3 file. So it was the same one for each show. And the actors could concentrate on acting. You didn't have somebody burning out their voice or talking into a microphone, not have it working. You know, you didn't want it sounding like a, a Burger King uh, speaker. We, we had some kicking, kicking amps on our friggin' hayride, you know, for, for a bunch of farmers and, you know, back backwater, you know, uh, blue collar guys they could they we got some bass out of these old speakers that'd just be underneath a hayride trailer which was awesome yeah. so you have to do different characters and stuff and and really tell your story during a 30 minute hayride so i, I think something like that's lost and then you know we'll uh, mainly a lot of voiceover work for advertisements and stuff we'll do with our sponsors with the podcast and then just throwing a little flair to it but uh it, it's something that's in there and you can just add to your scene and stuff i you know just even phrases and words we've done that and played around with it you could drop the tone you can have it go backwards uh we 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 played we had a bus scene where you'd have to walk through a bus uh, which was pretty cool. And it was a little mini school bus. And we took just a regular singing, the wheels on the bus go round and round, and we slowed it down by about 60%. And it is nightmare-inducing. <laughs> so little stuff like that. And you don't have to go out and, you know, hire a band and stuff to do this. You play around with your voice a little bit, and, you know, run it through the thing. You You can sing, you know, Ring Around the Rosary and, you know, throw up the pitch a couple points and you got your own own thing to go very cool yep, just another facet of the haunted uh, attraction industry that people don't really think about and it's a very, very important part of it awesome it awesome i've done some a little bit of voice work uh backwards oddities who's been on our show several times at on big scary show great and, great friend of the show yeah and he's been on wrestle horror as well um, in the first year that I dealt with him, he contracted me to do some voice work for the intro to his haunt. And I did like a two minute narration as people were prepping to go into the haunt. Best uh, way to save your house rules. We figured that out instead of having, you know, somebody taking tickets and explain your house rules. Just run a soundtrack at the beginning of it. Have them hit a doorbell button for an event box or run it every, you know, six minutes or whatever, you know record when you can you can add in the effect and go with it you can even find a little bit more talent in some of your actors yeah. you, know, you can get them to sit down and do part of it and then then they find that vested interest in it you have them do something a little bit like that you add their voice to it and uh they're they're making sure to promote their friends hey make sure you come out this weekend and you go to you know the graveyard scene in the churchyard and you're going to hear my voice telling you which cemetery stone to watch out for and on top of that, uh, when we do the intros for the Big Scary Show, we rotate. And sometimes we just do our normal thing, our normal voice. But other times we embellish and we make a little mini show out of the intro. We go wacky, zany radio show hosts every once in a while. I right. think I've done monster truck ones. So I've... Go, yeah, we. It, it gets interesting. It depends, you know how much coffee I've had and if it's two in the morning when I'm remembering to record. <laughs> nice. So, uh, you know, this has been, this has been awesome. Uh, Storm and the time is winding down. Absolutely. And we, uh, we don't want anybody admitting to murder on their Twitter during this. So, you know, <laughs> we, we, we don't want to keep this too long. All right. <laughs> right. Uh, but once again, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. I, oh, Absolutely. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to do so. I know, I know you being a big wrestling fan, I knew it would be entertaining and you did not disappoint. 
uh, and I would not be too surprised if this episode gets some good numbers. Yeah, hit, hit the numbers. Tell your friends about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I will let you know uh, when this goes on the air, but for now. Awesome. I need to bother all my wrestling friends with Here, you're going to watch. You're going to listen to this. Absolutely. They've got to you know, make them listen. Um, thank you again so much for myself and Donnie. Uh, we are the Wrestle Horror Podcast with our special guest, Storm, from the Big Scary Show. And we will catch you on the next episode. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks, guys. It's been great coming out tonight. Thanks for listening. Make sure you follow us on all, all of our social media outlets, facebook.com backslash Wrestle Horror, Instagram at Wrestle Horror, Twitter at Wrestle Horror, on our YouTube channel, the Wrestle Horror Channel. Also, you can find us at www.wrestlehorror.com. Oh,